Today I'm going to give you seven tips for photographing waterfalls. Now I'm going to assume that you know how to use all the settings on your cameras and that you're using a tripod. This is geared more toward beginning to intermediate photographers, so if you're a seasoned waterfall shooter, you're probably not going to see anything new here. Tip number one, before I go out, I like to research the area I'm going to online. I use resources like Flickr or even tourism sites to get an idea of what the location looks like if I've never been there before. You can get a good idea of what type of composition you'd like to get. Um, also, you can get an idea of what the terrain is like and what to expect if, you're, if you have to hike to your location. Um, Apps like alltrails.com are really good. Keep in mind I'm not sponsored by any of these websites or entities. I um, just want to get that out of the way. But uh, I use all trails a lot. Um, see what you're going to be dealing with if you have to hike into a location. Is it going to be a really hard hike? Of how much shade there's going to be? If you're unable to get there early enough to avoid harsh sunlight? Um, you can just get a lot by looking at photographs that have already been taken of the location. Tip number two. This one's probably not going to be really popular, but you need to get up early. Um, you should really be at your location right at daybreak for several reasons. One, you're going to have light that is subdued enough to where you're not going to get any harsh highlights on your water when you're doing your long exposure. The other reason is and I'm not a meteorologist, but I've experienced this and I actually did look it up. The wind is calmer early in the morning and it has something to do with the temperature of the surface and the way it reacts with the wind. But anyway, I've always noticed that when I go out early, the wind is always calmer. Unless there's some type of storm front coming through, um, you can usually depend on the wind being a lot calmer early in the morning. Why is this important? Because when you have your shutter open for longer periods of time, if the wind's blowing, you're going to have leaves that are going to be blurry, and, or grass or flowers. They're going to move, obviously, in the wind. You have your shutter open, everything's going to be blurry. In this particular photo, um, I did my planning right. The weather was going to be ideal. Had a rain shower the night before, but they were calling for a fair day. So I'm there at daybreak. I've got nice color on the leaves. Uh, it seems like when it's wet out, it gives everything a nice, richer color. In this photo, I pretty much did everything right except for the composition. But I'm going to use this sample just to show you that your exposure and everything can be really good if you start out first thing in the morning. I messed up the composition by having this rock in the center. I'm not sure why I did that, if I remember correctly. It's the only place where I could get some stable footing. I was actually out in the center of the stream. Um, I don't recommend you risking life and limb to get a shot, but sometimes I'll actually go out into the water with some waterproof uh, gear to try to get a different composition. Um, but anyway, the colors are better. The wind is calm. The light is great for long exposures. That's why you want to get out early in the morning. Tip number three, I always use a polarizer. Obviously it's going to allow you to keep your shutter open longer, but it also will take the glare or any harsh reflections off the water. Um, a lot of times it will even allow you to see the structure of the, the bottom of the creek or stream that you're photographing. You can see the shapes of the rocks and uh, it just adds more dimension to your photo. Even if I need a longer exposure time based on the lighting, I will not replace the polarizer with the ND. I will stack the filters. I find that by stacking the polarizer filter along with a three stop neutral density allows me a lot of latitude in my creativity as far as how I want the water to look. In this particular photo, I had gotten up early, I knew it was going to be overcast, the conditions were ideal. 
However, the swift running of the water was actually creating a breeze and that was causing the leaves to blur. Um, so what I did is actually I took two exposures, one to get the water flow look um, with a slower shutter speed and then I took another shot focusing on the leaves and also using a faster shutter speed and then I combined those two images in Photoshop. Sometimes you have to take these extra steps in order to get the desired effect that you're looking for. Also, if you can't get out early in the morning, go late in the evening. A lot of times you'll have similar conditions, although not usually as good as morning, but you'll have conditions that are close enough to where you can still get a good shot. Exposing to the right, as it is commonly called, simply means that you want the graph data in your histogram to be over to the right side as far as possible without blowing out your highlights. Because of the brightness of the water in your scene, your camera's metering will assume you have a very bright subject and exposed conservatively, and the shadow areas of your image will most likely be very dark and without much detail. In this example, the image on the back of the camera is exposed per the camera's matrix metering setting. Canon refers to it as evaluative metering. I actually like Canon's term for it better because the camera evaluates the entire scene versus other modes like spot metering that only meters a portion of the image at your focus point. As you can see the moss covered rock in the bottom right hand corner and the rock closest in the foreground are really dark with very little detail. Here is the histogram for this shot. The top box of the histogram shows the combined red, green and blue channels whereas each channel is separated below. Here you can see that a majority of the data is over to the left side. This is telling us that there are obviously a lot of dark areas in the image. I then overexposed this shot by two thirds of a stop and checked my histogram. Now it shows more graph data over to the right, but no part of the graph in any of the channels is touching the right side of the box, which indicates I do not have any blown out highlights. You can see the difference in the image as well. Your camera may also have blinkies, which shows a flashing area while reviewing the image that indicates blown out highlights as shown in this sample. Some waterfall scenes have so much contrast between the water and the surrounding landscape it can be very challenging, but if you expose to the right without blowing out the highlights, then you will have more to work with when post-processing your image. Focus stacking keeps your image sharp from the foreground to the background. I mainly use three focus points at f11 to f13. Sometimes I use more depending on the scene and how much distance there is between the foreground and the background. I focus one point on my closest foreground subject, one somewhere in the middle of the scene, and one at the far background subject. Then I combine the images in Photoshop. Now as you may know, using a very small aperture gives you greater depth of field. However, when you close down your aperture beyond, let's say, f11, f13, depending on your lens, diffraction occurs and without being too technical diffraction is when the light comes through your aperture and your lens and deflects off the blades and it ends up making your images soft. Keep in mind that focus stacking is not a necessity. You can get decent depth of field by focusing one third of the way into your scene using an f11 to f16. However if you want to get tack sharp images focus stacking is a good way to go. A bright sky in the background above your waterfall scene can be very distracting and pull your viewer's eye away from your main subject. Here's an example. Unless I have a very interesting sky with lots of cloud texture, I typically eliminate the sky from my composition if at all possible. By composing your image to get rid of distracting elements, your viewer's eye will be led to your main subject. In this particular photo, I purposefully eliminated the sky. It was very bland and gray and uninteresting as I wanted to keep my viewer's attention focused on the waterfall. Well, I hope you found these waterfall tips helpful. 
If so, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate your support, and until next time, take care.